Hello class. Um, here we are on the lecture. So uh, this is where we left off. I will try to use brevity so we can just get through this since we missed class yesterday. Um, so what happens after Luther is, as we left off on this slide, a guy named John Calvin comes around. Um, and the point that you need to know about, about Calvin is he is just a follower of Luther. So as we've said, Luther is not the first person to go against the Catholic Church, but he is the first successful person. And what's more important, because of the tracts that are being printed about him, and people are reading about him, people are starting to follow him and have uh, the, the nerve, I guess, to go ahead and speak out against the Catholic Church. And Calvin is one of them. He writes a very influential book that's still around today, Institution of the Christian Religion. Um, and the main thing about Calvin you need to know is, again, he's a follower of Luther, but he has some different views of it. He doesn't agree with everything. And this is where we get in that idea that we talked about um, the Protestants breaking up. And, and this would be the Catholics and the Greeks' worst nightmare. All kinds of different people interpreting the Bible, what they think uh, it says. And Calvin comes up with an idea of predestination. We're not going to cover it in this class. If you need to look it up, you can. It's, I think, a bit confusing. It can be. So maybe you would talk about it in a religious class or something. So again, he's very similar to Luther. Uh, but he doesn't agree every bit with him. Know about the Institutes of Christian Religion. It's still a, a famous book today. Um, and he relocates into Switzerland. And his, him and his followers do become very zealous. Um, and that's part of the Calvinist belief of predestination, that they're positive that they are right. So, next, uh, following that is another guy, Henry VIII. Remember, he's a king of England. He wants to divorce his wife, as you can see from the picture there, if you have not seen the other Boleyn girl. Not a great movie, but um, unfortunately, but it does make a point. He has to ask the Pope in Rome for permission to divorce. So think about that today. The President of the United States wants to get divorced. He has to ask Rome to do it. So you're seeing the power of the Catholic Church. And we talked about this. Is the Pope an important person? And half the class shakes their head yes, half shakes their head no. So it just depends on who you're talking to. But know about Henry is um, after he's been fighting with the Pope, but in 1534, notice that's post-Luther, 1517, he makes a statement that the king is the only supreme head of the earth, on earth of the Church of England, and he breaks with the Catholic Church over this idea of divorcing um, his wife or wives, and then founds the Anglican Church. So again, hope everyone sees that you're seeing the split, not only of now we have the Greek and the Catholic on one side, and the Protestants on the other, but the Protestants on one side are splitting everywhere amongst themselves. Okay, so here's what becomes important. Be sure to know this. Luther gains a lot of support. Remember, the first day of class, we talked about the Holy Roman Empire. What we know today is basically Germany and a group of these people uh, who are trying to uh, revitalize the Roman Empire. They're battling with the Pope. They've had a long history of this. Uh, and there's over 300 of these small entities. So they all have one ruler, that is for sure, who's a descendant or an heir of Charlemagne in some way. We talk about in the other class. But they all have independent autonomy. So it's very, very progressive for the time. Kind of interesting to think of it with the Germans that way. Um, we already talked about it in class. There's the part with Protestant sects. And um, when I made the joke about Protestant sects. And just know that Luther does allow clergy to marry. So that's why I make that joke. Because I don't say the word sect very well. Um, and 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 Protestant members are encouraged to have um, wives and to have sex in this, and it's mainly for procreation so that their religion can grow. Just keep that in mind. Uh, they're emphasized reading the Bible, preaching, and song, and all this a very different, a very different form of, of worship compared to the Catholics and the Orthodox. And know the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. It's a very important ruling. Be sure to know it. The ruler of the land would determine the religion of the land in the Holy Roman Empire. And dissidents are allowed to leave if they're unhappy. So we just talked about that. Is anyone allowed to choose their own religion when the Catholics are in charge? Say if you're even in England or Germany or France. No, the Catholic Church and the Pope is supreme. Uh, the Pope, I don't quote me on this, but somewhere in the 1200s, I'm pretty sure, makes a statement or maybe thousands that whatever the Pope says is basically word of God. And that's God speaking through him, even if it contradicts uh, scripture. So, the Catholic Church has had a real tight reign on all of Europe and everywhere where Catholicism is practiced. And so this is, hopefully you can see that first line there. This is completely different. The ruler of the land. Now, is this religion religious freedom as we think of it in America uh, even today? No, because your ruler has to decide if he allows this new Protestant or Catholic or whatever you want to be. But it's a step forward. 
Um, the division of Christianity is formally acknowledged, um, and Protestantism is allowed in the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, but Calvinism and other new forms of Protestantism at this time are ignored. So again, if we haven't talked about it in class, remember, things typically don't happen. Change, you know, Obama had a slogan, change. And I always make a point of that. Do we like change? And, and many people, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, unless it's changing what I'm doing. But, uh, change usually comes, I would argue, slowly. Uh, when it comes quickly, like in the French Revolution, you'll see catastrophic results. Uh, so keep that in mind. It's a slow change coming about. And high school teachers had to raise their hand to speak to Chuck Norris. Keep that in mind. So the Catholics don't sit idly by and just watch this happen. They do have a reformation of their own. Be sure to know it. If I go too fast to the slide, you can always pause it or you can always reference your book. Three things, the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, the Reformed Papacy of not John, George, or Ringo, but Paul III. He's the Pope at the time. Papacy just means the office of the Pope and the Council of Trent. So basically, the Catholic Church does get together. It does take an inner, inward look at itself. But keep this in mind. All they do in this um, is reaffirm, reaffirm Catholic beliefs. They oppose all Protestant beliefs. They still see Luther as the ultimate heretic. Okay, remember, uh, look, be sure to look up the difference between a heretic and an atheist and an agnostic. So Luther is the ultimate heretic to them. It's someone who believes 99% of what they do, but then that 1%, faith alone, right? Luther says faith alone, that's enough to throw them sidetrack and to mislead people, the Catholic Church would say, and that makes you a heretic. Um, faith and works are required, and the use of indulgence is actually strengthened after they see it as a good thing. So they disagree with every Protestant belief out there. Be sure to keep that in mind for the exam. So what happens after that um, is... Uh, some wars called the French Wars of Religion. And so you're seeing a difference here in this slide of what happens in France compared to what happens in the Holy Roman Empire or what we call Germany. And just note right there the Edict of Nantes, uh, Nantes by Henry IV. Um, he begins a path of secularization and separation of church and state in France. And these French Protestants, are known as Huguenots, get some religious freedom. So you do start to see this. So it's starting to spread through Europe. But in the next set of slides I'm going to show, you'll see that's pulled back very quickly in France. And it'll kind of give us this a setup of a story we're going to talk about between the areas of France and what we call Germany that last all the way up until the 20th century. And some might even argue today. So what happens with all this? Luther's 1517. By 1618, that's 101 years later, the Catholics and the Protestants basically cannot stand each other. And they go to war. Uh, and they go to war basically in the Holy Roman Empire which is basically Germany, and it is devastating because the Holy Roman Empire by that time is split 50-50 between Catholics and Protestants, um, and Catholic forces from France, everywhere, Denmark, Sweden, Spain, all involved, and it is a horrible, horrible time um, for this area, and it's the worst catastrophe since the Black Death of the 14th century, okay, uh, where 8 million people were killed. And this is Christians killing Christians, basically, as you can see from the paintings below down there. So again, this idea of splitting Christianity, splitting a religion leads to uh, a civil war, basically. And I think you can make some connection with this loosely if you if you listen closely with what we see in Islam today with the Sunni-Shiite split that we have. And we see this uh, civil war going on amongst us, Islam, which many Americans don't understand. Well, it's just doing it at a different point in history. As you can see here, Christianity has had a very similar uh, idea with the split of this religion. Um, and know this, the Treaty of Westphalia does end it. Be sure to know that. And it reorganizes the entire map. The Holy Roman Empire is wiped off uh, of the face of the earth. And all Christians in the Holy Roman Empire, these are now called German states, um, not just the ruling sect, um, were guaranteed the right to worship in public. And Calvinism and all these other Protestant sects are legally recognized. So now you're seeing the second step much, much closer toward freedom of religion in an area. Um, so the Holy Roman Empire is fractured. As we said, Germany will stay disunited, disunified excuse me, for another 200 years. So no war. Every time Germany unifies, there appears to be a war, as we'll see it throughout history in the 1800s, the 1900s twice. <clears throat> uh, oh, sorry about that. No, uh, 1900s once. Uh, the Alsace-Lorraine, we might talk about it in class a little bit, but it's a highly disputed area between France and Germany that will kind of bounce back and forth within class, showing... Uh, how France and Germany will fight over this. 
And religion is no longer the driving force of a foreign policy of a nation. Uh, and allegiance to the Pope in Rome is absolutely severed by this. Okay, so be sure to know that the Treaty of Westphalia. So there you have a new map, the map we would look at now, and you notice right away the Holy Roman Empire is gone. Okay, finally, lastly, witchcraft mania. I think this is the first picture here. These I'll talk about it more in class. Uh, this little drawing by a student I had, a former student, and she would just make these drawings and then gave them all to me at the end of the semester. Kind of neat. Uh, so witchcraft mania, we, we talked about it. We might have time to go over a video on it and stuff in class. We'll see. But why? What's happening here? Why are women being accused? 75% of them women, they're single, widowed, 50 plus, milkmaids, peasants, servant girls, small villages. What's the story here? So if you've read the book, you should understand it by now. Um, these are basically, it's part of the Protestant Reformation. Everyone's world has been turned upside down. They don't know what to do. They need a scapegoat. They need to accuse someone. The women, as you can see, 75% of them are, are women, but almost all of them are single or widowed, which shows they don't have a man to defend them. So you can see here they are a scapegoat, and this is a prime example of patriarchalism at its worst in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries. Okay, And they're in these small villages where logic and reason is not used, and everything's based off of one's interpretation of the Bible. And again, who's interpreting that now? The Pope in Rome? No, just any anybody of this new religion that whatever form of Protestantism that you actually uh, adhere to. So Christianity has become divided and, and broken up and a lot of different interpretations now. Okay? Um, and every, hopefully you guys are watching this, so you'll know when I show one on Thursday. Um, but Dr. Palm gave me these, and they're Best of American Church Bulletins, really printed in church bulletins. The Fasting and Prayer Conference includes meals. Okay, pretty good.